So yeah, I'm data scientist at Bolt, and uh, I also graduated from Quantitative Economics program in 2018. I also had the lectures from Indrek, so maybe we even learned the same material. Uh, but uh, now he invited me to give you a guest lecture. And uh, okay, why it's experience in data science? Uh, like I'm more like product data scientist, meaning that I'm not only work on the machine learning models, uh, like, like pre tuning and so on. I'm also like, uh, Mm, define the problems and define if there's like some product problem can be solved with data with machine learning models, then actually like, building these machine learning models, deploying into production, and in the end uh, doing a lot of experiments about these models, about different models, algorithms, and so on. And actually, this topic is uh, very important in the full data science work, and that's why I'm, well, I'm talking about it today. Uh, so, but um, to give uh, like my talk more like usable for you, I'd like to know like, what do you like, what would you like to do after your graduation? Uh, which area is uh, more or more attractive for you? Like, is it, like data science, data analytics, product manager uh, role, or something? <laughs> PhD is also an option. Yes, sure. <laughs> um, so, I would like. Yes, yeah, okay. uh, did I mention like uh, would like to do something else? Uh, portfolio management. Uh huh. Financial okay. analysis. Financial analysis. Oh, uh, all right. Uh, so like, uh, yeah, it, it's uh, this topic is more related when you're like, working with some product, uh, like if you're an analyst uh, or like, data scientist or product uh, uh, manager. It's maybe less related to like portfolio optimization or something, but still, uh, you can <coughs> learn what you see today and apply the result. Uh, so, today uh, we will talk about different types of experiments uh, which uh, can be done. Uh, the first type is uh, uh, the most traditional one, so like A B tests, A B N testing. Uh, then we will talk about multi arm bandit based experiments. Um, third type, it's like some other non-traditional experience where we, you don't have anyone control group. And then we will sum up with the tips uh, and tricks uh, like to remember for you for the future. In the end, if you will have a time, um, uh, I can share more about my experience as a data scientist and or like tell more about like what uh, skills which I learned during quantitative economics uh, is usable for me now uh, after graduation. So yeah, uh, uh, and uh, don't uh, be afraid to ask questions. And uh, if you ask questions, uh, you will get a candy. So don't be shy, ask questions <laughs> and eat chocolate. <laughs> um, right, and uh, we will start uh, with uh, A, B, and testing. Mm. Uh, have you heard before about A, B tests? Yes, so like, uh, yeah, so just like, huh? Just for like, yeah. Uh, okay, <laughs> but uh, in a nutshell, what it is, it's a control randomized experiment uh, where you have at least two groups, control and treatment. And the goal of this process is to identify and measure uh, impact of considered variable. So, to give an example, like, it will be curated to both because I work at both, uh, and it's close to me. We have an app bolt, and uh, when we want to make order, we have uh, such like a screen, nap, and there is this button uh, select bolt. Let's uh, imagine then, like once upon a time, designers decided to change the color of this button. So instead of green, uh, they uh, thought, okay, let's change it to red. But uh, hello, but uh, we can't just roll out this new color for all all of our users. Because we are not sure, will this uh, new red will be beneficial for them or not? And uh, to quantify this effect of our variable, it's a curve button, we will do A-B tests. Um, so what we will do? Uh, we will uh, measure how this new curve, red curve button will increase number of writes, which uh, users uh, do. And, uh, we will split our users in 2080, 20, so 80% of users you don't have any changes, so they will like have this green curve, 
and 20% of users will have uh, read. But then is there a few like uh, run this experiment for some time and uh, afterwards we have this plot where we measure what was the average number of writes made by users in control group and in treatment group. And this uh, plot shows uh, for us that uh, actually treatment group uh, has a higher number of writes. So it's more than three uh, versus uh, control group having uh, about like two and then uh, like half average number of writes. So basically this plot shows to us that our new red color is much better because it gives a uh, more number of rights. But uh, maybe you can think, uh, is there something here, like maybe we should add something or... Where, where's the correlation? Correlation of what? Where's the correlation between having a red or green button and more rights? Like how yeah, could we possibly yeah. say that people are uh, taking, uh, using both more just because they're bondage rates? To me, that sounds absurd. Okay. Like it just sounds like uh, something that we happen to like stumble upon, which is uh, which which is like completely random. Like uh, surely there is no way we can actually say that just because our bondage rates that we're gonna be using the service more. Yeah, good point. Uh, so how okay. have you chosen uh, the target group with whom uh, you have changed the button? Like, uh -huh. you, you told it's 20%, right? Yep, So 20%. How did you choose the 20% of the group? It's it's random. Yeah, it's, it's usually random, yeah. How but it's a good random. point to think about how, if this like really random or <laughs> something happened, it's not random at all. Yeah, right. uh, yeah actually, can you see? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, any other? I have one more question. Yeah. Like, uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and why have you, like, what is the reason for having 80 20 division so with the percentage? Maybe you should have taken uh, 40% to change. Yeah, it's another and... important point to think here. Yeah. So, what is the reason? Because of Pareto principle? Yeah, yeah, usually it, uh, it really depends on test. Here I just put 80 20 just, mm -hmm. just because it's uh, sometimes you do 50 50, mm -hmm. but sometimes 80 20, and especially you can roll out something, uh, something new for like tiny bit of like a share of users because you're not sure maybe it will be totally worse and you don't want to affect all other users. Basically. Okay, so um, we actually like um, do it in case because we have this data like. We've, uh, no. through randomizing, we've proven that the, the people with the red button use that. Um, how exactly would, would this uh, result in anything beneficial? I mean, maybe this red curve associated, okay, it's more attractive for users, but no. And maybe they will do more rights if it's more variation situation. So, so like, uh, we took the 80-20 split, and based on the sample, we proved that the, the people with the red uh, button use that more. So we would change everyone's app to red and then see if uh, the same holds true. Yeah, basically it's like a natural experiment. So you run something and compare control treatment group and then roll out this best option for all. And uh, yeah, but uh, it's very hard because uh, then you should see this improvement for all, but you're not sure when something changed. This or the other, sorry. Uh, any other idea? Maybe the reason that you start this it starts to grow is not because like, the color is red, not green. It's because there is a change of the color. Mm -hmm. Maybe you, if you switch it to blue as well, then you change the course because like uh, when a uh, customer opens the app, so it sees there is a change, maybe somehow it, it affects on, on the uh, customer. Mm -hmm. But uh, the reason is that it is a change. It doesn't matter if it's red or blue. So if you switch from red then to another color, mm -hmm. maybe the same happens as well. Yeah, but uh, here maybe like some research was done that red color should increase. But uh, yeah, um, my point here was, uh, but yeah, I really like that you proposed so many ideas. <laughs> my point was about uh, this averages. So like basically here we just took what like uh, we had like bunch of users and uh, we took a mean. We, for bunch of users we have number of rights and we took a mean. Uh, how do you think like should we look only at mean or at some like, an average value or something else. What is usually like? Right, exactly. Yeah. Standard deviation and this confidence intervals. Uh, I'm not sure how it's visible from, from back, 
But uh, here you see this your confidence intervals for control group and confidence intervals from treatment group. So basically, you can notice that they are overlapping this area. And yeah, from statistics, we know if confidence intervals overlap with each other, then these two series, two series of data are like not statistically significant. So basically, if you look at just only on this graph, we can see, okay, maybe this treatment group you know, like is better. But in reality, there is no statistical significance. So here we can see that only with this, like, if we would stop here, we would make a mistake and just adding some, like, one more additional information, uh, it prevent us from uh, going to like, the work results and uh, that uh, concluding that trail cover is, be uh, is uh, better. Uh, but um, it's only one thing which could go wrong during experiment. In reality, yeah, you, uh, some points were already mentioned about like one metric why we should concentrate in number of rates. Is this uh, correct? Maybe some like, conversion is more important for us, not number of rights. Conversion meaning like number of users who made the search and then made the right. Then uh, wrong t-test. So uh, t-test is like uh, what is used to calculate these confidence intervals. And if you Google for it, there are like dozens of different t-tests and actually which to apply it for any particular situation. So it's very important to know uh, which one is uh, useful for uh, for experiment. Next point, and so like, uh, there could be not enough users in experiment. Uh, let's say in that example, there could be just uh, 100 users, uh, but uh, uh, it's obviously not enough because this 100 can be just like some tiny fraction of the full user base and they will not reflect like um, population that we have. Um, fourth point, it's uh, what could go wrong during that experiment is that some overlapping experiment. So we consider our example, but maybe at the same time by any chains, other pricing team, let's say, they will also launch the experiment and they, by any chain, they choose the same randomization and all, all, all our users, which were in our treatment group, occurred in their treat, uh, control and, and uh, vice versa. So basically change which we would discover in our experiment would be not because of our change, but because of change of other team. So it's a very important point, point and which could go wrong during experiment. And uh, next point is uh, like clicker users. Uh, what are they? Uh, it means that um, uh, we started an experiment and one user had an Android, boy, uh, Android phone uh, when we started. And then uh, like in the middle of our experiment, uh, this user just uh, uh, switched to iPhone. And in the, we uh, made uh, our organization based on platform. And in the beginning of the experiment, this user were in control group. Uh, but in the like, uh, second part of experiment, it occurred in like uh, another test group. So basically, one user occurred in uh, separate test groups, and meaning that uh, we cannot now properly uh, analyze this uh, data because uh, it's uh, it's already biased. One user uh, is the test control and treatment. So it's like basically such a sim simple thing as A/B test, control and treatment, but a lot of uh, stuff happening you know, over there and a lot of things could go wrong. And now let's see what can we do to prevent um, these issues. And yeah, and yes, you can see like generating numbers is easy, but actually generating numbers which you can trust, getting results which you can trust is very hard. Mm. Uh, first of all, let's talk about uh, metric. So, it's uh, very important always to use the proper metric, which uh, would reflect what we want to receive from this experiment. Uh, and first advice is uh, to have only one metric as a goal, so which would be your main metric, but also during your experiment, uh, uh, you should monitor multiple metrics. So let's say in the, uh, our ex um, example, main metric was number of rights, but at the same time, we should look um, how users are distributed uh, across platforms. So uh, we expect that there will be like a similar proportion of users in Android and iPhone. But if we monitor this metric across time, if on the first day of our experiment we discover that uh, uh, we have only users from Android, then something good uh, went wrong. 
because maybe some bug occurred or something else. Because we expect that there should be users from Android and Android, and if we see only one platform, then something goes wrong. That's uh, why it's important to monitor multiple metrics. Uh, another point uh, that, um, yeah, we should, uh, during experiments, there should be one main metric. Uh, why? Because uh, like decision making will be much uh, simpler. So you, if, like, product manager says that, um, Oh, like number of rights, conversion, uh, and uh, average rate price is all of these three metrics are important. Then, what conclusion uh, we will do if uh, one of these metrics increases by 30% and two of these metrics decrease by 10%? So, like, how we like make this trade off and identify like uh, what uh, should be done here? And if you have just one metric, you will just look at this metric to like. Uh, calculate statistical significance and to make conclusion. Uh, also, why only one metric, uh, but not many? Because if you have many metrics, then your false, false positive rate will increase, meaning that uh, you will see that there is uh, uh, like this uh, difference between conform treatment, but, but in reality, there will, the results will be not statistically significant. Uh, so it's related to this type one and type two errors during tests. So the, the, you should have the statistic yeah. courses and so on. So uh, you already uh, studied this hypothesis testing and so on? Uh, we are studying yeah. that now. Oh, cool. <laughs> then you should know about this like <laughs> hypothesis and so on. Um, uh, yeah, but um, in uh, like in real, uh, yes, uh, you should have only one metric, but there can be exceptions. Uh, and sometimes, okay, two, you, you can have two of these main metrics, and there is a way to overcome this increase in false positive rate. Uh, one of it uh, is a bond Fioroni correction. Uh, so, if, we, if, we, if somebody says that uh, in our experience, you will have uh, uh, 20 hypotheses, meaning like 20 metrics to consider, then there is a bond Fioroni correction which allows uh, to overcome. Uh, false positive rate increase. Um, so you know about this p value, uh, like uh, the, like which uh, shows um, like uh, how confident you can be like uh, in uh, your analysis. So one for any correction, it's just like divide this uh, p value by number of your metrics or hypothesis, and then you should use that one to calculate statistical significance. Like, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, in the end, I will share a like, link to the slide so you can uh, have a look at all of this later as well. Uh, the, coming back to metrics, uh, proportion uh, metrics are more recommended. Um, what are uh, type of metrics in general? So during your experiment, you can make different types of metrics like number of rights and conversion, and uh, they. Uh, to, it's important to distinguish type of metrics because uh, um, it will influence which p test to use, uh, which p value to use, uh, and, and so on. And there exist three main types. It's um, continuous proportion ratio. Continuous metric, like uh, it tells uh, by itself, uh, so it's some numeric value, like uh, gross bookings per user. So it's just like some thousand or, hun or hundred, some numeric value. Uh, second type is a proportion metric, um, and uh, it's uh, it's just like some binary value or one or zero. So it just indicates if you user uh, does something or not. So example proportion of users who completed any groups after sign up. Um, it can be one or zero, or uh, did user open email or not one or zero. But why it's called proportion? Because uh, when you aggregate uh, like this one of zeros across all the users, you actually receive share of users who did something. That's why it is. And third type is a ratio metric, uh, and uh, a ratio metric uh, is uh, when you have some two numeric values and you divide one by each other. So if you have a total request from users and you have finished it from users, when you divide one by each other, you have like, changed the uh, uh, three quotation ratio. 
Uh, yeah, uh, why uh, and uh, proportion metric is more recommended? Why? Because uh, in most cases, in reality, you're more interested in user do something, not like how much they do, uh, which will be continuous metric. Um, so why it's important to distinguish all these types? Because uh, as I said, there are a lot of different statistics which are used to identify uh, significance of uh, results. Uh, and, um, like, uh, you don't need to remember by hard formulas which stands behind uh, MWW test or VHT test because uh, like, they are already implemented in our Python. So if you just know that you have ratio metric and your sample size is large, then you need to use a data method fast test. So, uh, or if you have proportional metric, then you use a his squared test. Um, yep. Uh, it was about metrics, and now we're to the second part uh, in, in A-B tests. It's about sample size. Before doing any tests or experiments, uh, first question which should be set is uh, how many users should be in your test groups to identify some uh, difference uh, across control treatment. Uh, and again, like formula which calculates how many users should be in test depends on metric type. Um, fortunately, there exist uh, already uh, different online tools which allows uh, to uh, calculate the sample size. For example, we can have a look uh, at uh, Evan Miller. And if you go there, uh, we can uh, <coughs> see uh, we, we need to input just two values, like some baseline rate and minimal detectable effect. And then we will see uh, like what number of users should be in our experiment. Does it work? No. Oh, yes. So you see, um, so two, met, uh, two things which uh, we should put here. It's a baseline conversion rate. It's like actually baseline rate of your metric. It's not, it can be not conversion though. Uh, and the minimal detectable effect. First metric can be derived from historical data. So if you know that conversion before your experiment was 30%, you can use it. And uh, second thing, uh, minimal detectable effect. It means like what difference between control and, and treatment uh, you want to detect or what difference you expect. So meaning if you introduce some features and you expect that it will change conversion by 10%, like you can put this it here or, um, not, uh, or uh, uh, this 10% can be used as a reference uh, to uh, uh, indicate minimal detectable effect. Because if your actual like, real difference between control and treatment then will be 4%, it will just tell you that your results are not statistically significant. Uh, so, any questions about that part? Yeah? Uh, here we have a question, I think, right? Because, for example, for both, you have users and you can track it. Mm -hmm. For example, we are testing a test type uh, for different regions. And we don't know exactly how many users um, will come to the website. How do we decide that sample size? I mean, but uh, if you uh, if you just launch website, yeah, you don't know. But uh, if you had it, like if you your site was working before, then you know, like how many users on so average. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, but you know, like uh, how my how many visits were like before, uh, daily yeah, or weekly. Like, um, deciding on sample size of the different users for data. Uh -huh. So basically, if you calculate like sample size, for example, using this uh, tool, and then you see, uh, then you mm -hmm. can look like how many users were per day, uh -huh. uh, in like how many visits were per day, and if it was. Uh, like uh, 1,000, <coughs> then you should run this experiment for two days, basically, to collect this 1,300 users. So it was a question about that, or? <laughs> OK. <laughs> mm. uh, so coming back to slides. 
Uh, but uh, what you should pay, uh, pay attention to about that, that uh, if our, uh, if we, okay, uh, set this matrix, calculate sample size, and uh, we run experiment, and there is enough uh, users uh, which are higher than the minimum required sample size. Uh, but uh, if we observe that actual difference between contour and treatment is less than minimal detectable effect, uh, then we should uh, uh, recalculate sample size again. Uh, because um, uh, let's uh, see, we indicate minimal detectable effect as 5% and uh, uh, have this 1000 as sample size. If after an experiment we see that difference between control and treatment is actually 4%, uh, then uh, uh, for us it's not statistically. Uh, uh, so we then put this 4% here and the sample size will increase. And if we have in our experiment, more users than this new required sample size, then we can make a conclusion. Um, but if not, then uh, okay, we uh, didn't get enough users and we should run the mirror experiment. Uh, and because uh, if the smaller the detectable effect, the higher will be sample size. So we can uh, even look like uh, at this too. So if uh, I put here just one, you see it will be like three, 33,000 users. So basically, if you introduce some changes which just like uh, have very, very low um, influence on the on metric which you are looking at, then uh, you should have your really big uh, user for this experiment. Um, So it's like the smaller the difference between control and treatment group, the larger will be sample size. Uh, and also we have this baseline value, like uh, in that example, it was like 50 or 40%. And the smaller this like baseline value is the uh, larger sample size will be as well. Sorry, in this case, the baseline conversion rate is the uh, proportion of, I mean, the division of like the customers who, cho who have chosen to write uh, over the total customers? You can uh, calculate uh, different conversions. It can be like uh, persons uh, uh, who made the right after search or who had finished, finished right after search. Or like, uh, All right, but here, which is more profitable for you? Like, I mean, it depends on, uh, on the case. So oh. like, uh, it depends on what you are testing. You, want to, like, you can test design or you can test machine learning model. So okay. it's like, totally dependent on this. And for minimum detectable effect, uh -huh. how do you decide this? Like how how much to take? So uh, it depends on like what uh, what you expect. If you expect really like a high impact of new feature, uh, then you can uh, set higher value for that. All so right. if you expect that the uh, difference should be about ten percent, then you can put like five, for example. But if you see okay the different the impact will be not so mm -hmm. high, then uh, this minimum detectable effect should be lower. Okay. Okay. All right. Do you want more candy? No, no. <laughs> okay. If you like to continue giving them asking questions. <laughs> no, I mean, it's all right. So, and uh, we saw that uh, the, uh, the lower difference we want to detect, the lower baseline metric, the more users we should have for experiment. And uh, once upon a time, we can discover that we need uh, five, uh, 500,000 of users. And uh, for such experiment, we would need like half a year to run this experiment. Who of you think that uh, like, we can run experiment for half a year and why? Yeah. We can probably run an experiment for a long time. Like uh, there's probably experiments that we go for six years. Yeah. For six months, as long as, as long as it's an experiment on human, there, there are bound to be changes in the experiment. It's not, it's not going to be it's going to be in a, in a laboratory. One can control the outcomes for a long period of time, but because it's human, there are bound to be changes. So it's going to distort our results. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, we could also create like historic data points for which we compare. Um, I mean, mostly just measure, it depends on how we are measuring this data. Because if we are saying that uh, the experiment will run for 
let's say two months, mm -hmm. and then this is, this is the thing that we're really looking uh, for the difference between the values of uh, those people who are sampling at the start and at the end, mm -hmm. or against uh, the data that we originally wanted to compare it to. Mm -hmm. uh, so in real life, like. Uh, if you, your experiment take uh, like one period of time, there some changes can happen. And so your users uh, who are like in the beginning of your, your user base in the beginning of your experiment can like differ from users uh, who appear in the end of the experiment. And also like uh, company itself and product itself uh, can change during such a long period. Or like company can grow so fast so that uh, it cannot allow like to run one experiment because uh, it needs more iterations and uh, uh, faster like, uh, conclusions about what, what is happening. Uh, so that's why like, at Bolt, we don't run like half a year, like year experiments, uh, because uh, we are changing a lot. And uh, usually we do like one week or one month experiment. Uh, like there are exceptions, exceptions for sure, but uh, it's like- but Some are smaller, right? You wrote hundreds of thousands. Mm. I mean, uh, well, for weeks uh, or months, like some percentages are small. But uh, yeah, yeah, it depends on what the, like your baseline metric and oh, yeah. the difference. You, you so we choose such for, 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 yeah. for, for I mean, uh, we run uh, for like many many countries. Oh, so for many countries. Yeah. All right, all right. Now then uh, we have like a sufficient amount of users. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Um, a-B test is just one part of experiment, and actually, if you need to run this long experiment, multi-arm bandits uh, can be used. Uh, and I will explain why they can, uh, like, they are better than traditional A-B tests. Uh, who have you heard about uh, multi-arm uh, multi bandits? No. So, like, huh? <laughs> but <it's okay. laughs> but uh, let's imagine that we are in Gazida and we are in, this, in front of one slot machines. So uh, in the beginning, we don't know like which uh, which machine we should choose because we don't know like uh, which machine gives us more money, and we started to explore. So we try machine number one, we try machine number two, we try machine number three. And then we discover that machine number two gives to us more money. So we explore a bit, and we then we exploit this knowledge about second machine. And we play it for many, many times. But then, OK, there are still some machines left. And uh, then we start exploring again. We try machine number four. It's still less than machine number two gave, gave to us. We try machine number five, six. And then we, explore, uh, we see that machine number seven, let's say, gives to us even higher pay of machine number two. Then we exploit this knowledge, uh, like updated knowledge, and uh, we started to use, use machine number seven to gain like as, as much as possible. So what we did, we explore some part, and then we exploit this knowledge about like higher pay of. Then we again we explore a bit more, and then again we uh, started to exploit this no updated knowledge. That uh, was the difference uh, between uh, uh, A-B tests and multi-arm bandits. Like in, in A-B tests, you, we have two separate stages. First of all, we explore and then we exploit. So like uh, we have this control treatment and then apply options which is better in the world for all users. And in uh, multi-arm bandits, uh, these two phases uh, are combined. So we are explore and exploit at the same time. Uh, another like picture of how to understand the difference uh, uh, between these two tests. So in A/B test, uh, we have a split of users, and the split stays for the whole experiment. So in this case, we have option A, B, and C, and uh, they are like equal proportion of users which comes to this option, and it stays for the whole experiment. Uh, with uh, multi-arm bandits. Uh, this split of users, it changes over time. And uh, like how it changes, because the algorithm uh, tries to maximize value which we get from, uh, from users. So this great A option uh, used to us higher payoff, and we already discovered it during like uh, first day of experiment, 
and to don't have any loss uh, and to maximize our payoff which we gave uh, which we have from experiment we just uh, put my, like uh, um, roll out like this option a for more users so like you can compare like green areas on the right uh, and left plots and you see like on this band it is higher so uh, any questions about budgets um, all right but uh, yeah but how this uh, redistribution works um, so like to uh, understand which option is better and to do the split to understand uh, where to uh, roll out like more users to which option uh, we need to do this exploration which, uh, as we like do with this uh, machine now as an example there are different algorithms uh, which uh, do this exploration and first one is like epsilon greedy so you just have like this epsilon value like 0 0.01 and um, you will explore in one percent of cases so if algorithm tells you that for this user like you should apply option a in 99 percent of cases you will apply this option which is more often but in one percent you will do some exploration so apply, uh, use uh, not arm which are <coughs> optimal by algorithm but uh, something else to do this exploration uh, another uh, algorithm which does this is the upper confidence bound it's like it's so-called principle of optimus in the optimus in the face of uncertainty so if algorithms tells you that for this incoming user you, you should apply option b and uh, it is confident like for 99 its confidence is 99%, then in 99% of cases it will apply op this option, but in 1% it will export. Don't apply this, but something random action. Uh, but if algorithm tells you for this user you should apply option B and confidence is just 50%, then in 50% of cases uh, op this option B will, will be applied, but in 50% uh, algorithm will select some other R. Uh, third algorithm for this exploration is a Thompson sampling or it's also called Bayesian. Um, uh, how is different from our upper confidence bound uh, uh, then to explain more. So you see that uh, like in, during our second day of this experiment Proportion, uh, the day. proportion uh, of users between option uh, is 70 percent 20 and 10. so uh, if algorithm tells us oh, that for this user we should uh, use option a and we know that actually like share of this option a is 70 percent then in 70 percent algorithm mm -hmm. will apply this more to version uh, option but in 30 percent of others it will do exploration some uh, random action so so that's why it's called vision and uh, like there are many resources like which method which algorithm where to apply um, Thompson sampling is uh, better because uh, it will like reduce exploration uh, but still provide you the highest payoff because uh, with epsilon greedy you have just like this exploration uh, rate uh, um, just the same value of exploration during the whole experiment and maybe it's too high and then you will like do too many random, random actions and you will uh, not get as much as you could with lower value. Um, but it's about algorithms and now like about practical uh, cases where uh, multi-arm bandits can, uh, can be applied for a which type of test uh, the good thing about uh, bandits is that they can be applied for short tests and for long tests as well. Like uh, short tests, it can be like some holidays and seasonal promotion. promotion. Let's say there is a Black Friday and the marketing uh, company would like to test uh, like what is the like this promotion during Black Friday. Friday is better. If this company would run just A/B tests then it should run it for the whole Black Friday 
but okay, to run experiments for this Black Friday and went to apply results because Black Friday is already ended. And uh, with algorithm bandits, uh, we can uh, like do it uh, right Many away. Hours, right? Huh? Really hours. Yes, so uh, we can start like uh, with some proportion of users, but then we will optimize it. We will redistribute users in optimal way, and we will, like maximize what we can do during this one day. Um, for one test, uh, it can be some like automation for scale, so we can just set it and forget it. As in our example, with like five hundred thousand users, uh, we can set up just this uh, bandits because we can be sure that they will not keep this 50-50 split for the whole six months. They will redistribute users and change this proportion based on which option is better in this particular time. So we can, we can be sure that we will optimize our metric, like our number of orders or a number of, uh, like the sum of purchases made. And the second case here, it's a uh, problem. Um, here, uh, contextual bandits are used, and uh, what they do is they learn some information like context about users, uh, and then apply optimal option for this particular users, which are optimal for exactly this user features and not like the whole population. And that's it's based on context and why it's called contextual bandits. Contextual bandits is just like another word for. Um, simple uh, one state reinforcement learning. So like somebody if you heard about reinforcement learning. Yeah, no. Uh, but okay, uh, we will look now at uh, how it works and then you will know it. So in uh, like um, contextual bias, uh, what we do, we have some context about user, like user features, and then we define most optimal actions based on these features. And then we have reward. Reward means that if algorithm guess what it should be done in this particular case or not. With multi-armed bandits, we have just like two steps, action and reward. Uh, action meaning which option to apply and reward if uh, this action chosen by uh, bandit uh, was, like, should be applied there or not. And in contextual bandits, uh, we have some additional like the box here, like a state, state meaning context. So first of all, we define what are user features, uh, like it can be like country or like history of purchases. Uh, then we define for such users with such feature, what is the best state, what is the best action to apply. And then we have a reward, like uh, if uh, algorithm guess what should be there or not. Um, Yep. Um, we already saw uh, this uh, difference between A-B tests and uh, multi arm bandit testing. The proportion of users changed and like mean option can take like almost whole population of users. But with conventional bandits, it cannot like reach 100% because maybe this first option is better for one set of users. And second option is much better for like uh, another like users with another features. That's why if you uh, notify the best options for all users as multi arm bandits, uh, but based on context, it will choose the upper, most appropriate option. Uh, is it clear? Okay. Um, yep. We talked about ABN testing. Uh, uh, we talked about multi arm band based experiment. But uh, in all of these cases, uh, we have such things that uh, at one point of time, users were distributed uh, in some groups. But sometimes we cannot allow it for us uh, because we cannot uh, like have such situations that at the same time, user will have different features. Uh, it's especially important, like in cases when you have two sides, like two-sided market. For example, in right lane, you have riders and drivers, uh, and sometimes you can allow uh, like riders have different features because uh, they will like influence drivers, and drivers will influence riders, and there will be such a feedback loop. 
Uh, it also like uh, another example of uh, to study market. Market is Airbnb where we have like people who um, offer apartment or those who rent apartment or like pre-sided markets where you, like food delivery. You can have restaurants, riders, or restaurants, couriers, and uh, users, uh, and like all this combinations and impacts of one side to another, like uh, involve a lot of complexity. Uh, this like there is this uh, third type of experiment as test without control group. Um, first type is a so-called interleaved test. Uh, I will give you an example of what we had. No, like we had not only rider app but also driver app. And in driver app, uh, we show for drivers map with areas uh, where we expect will be more rides because we want drivers to go to this area with like we get orders. And there is algorithm which stands behind this map. Uh, once uh, we improve this algorithm, and we wanted to compare old algorithm which produced map with a new algorithm. Uh, in traditional AB test, we would just like uh, split drivers into groups, and for 50% of drivers show old algorithm, and for 50% of drivers show new algorithm. But algorithm is based on how many like drivers actually are distributed in the city, and uh, if drivers see old map, it's actually influence algorithm which calculates map for treatment group, so for a new algorithm. So you see, if we would just split uh, in traditional AB testing set, uh, setup, then our groups would influence each other. So control group would actually influence algorithm which calculates like something for treatment group. And that's why we can like not conduct experiments in this way because uh, we will not like get, we will not, we can un can't analyze results in the end. And uh, what we've done, uh, uh, we split like groups, not across users, but uh, across times, time slots. So uh, we run an experiment for two weeks, and uh, on Monday, on the first week, uh, from seven to eight a.m., um, we showed like all algorithm, all map for all users, and it was our control group. Next hour, we switch, uh, and uh, from eight to nine, it, we showed like new algorithm, and and so on. And uh, like next week, like this uh, group shifted, and over the like, Monday 7 and 8 p.m. it was shifting group. Uh, so you see, like during these two weeks, each time slot it was conference treatment group, and afterwards we can like actually like compare, and one week it's a control, and one the second week is a treatment. And so in this setting, we actually like, uh, groups are not influencing each other. We have a clear uh, clean data and we can analyze it. But actually here, like changing the algorithm so much maybe would uh, make the application stop for a while like within the changes, right? Yeah, or no. no? No, I mean, it doesn't influence a lot. So it just, it has a very, very low latency and uh, so it I mean, doesn't it matter. Very fast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So, but it's a good point. So, if this change would take like yes. minutes, then it will it will it have an impact. Yeah. Good point. Uh, so, it's uh, one thing uh, which can be used if uh, experiments cannot be done with control group. Uh, another thing, uh, another interesting approach to deal with such a situation is uh, like uh, use synthetic control groups. Uh, so, in this example with drivers, what you could do. Uh, if we would measure number of rights, like uh, with one algorithm and with another, um, we could uh, roll out this experiment for all our users and it will be like treatment and control group can be estimated from some model. Uh, let's say uh, before an experiment starts, uh, we will model number of rights, in, let's say in time, from let's say, like a function of number of rights in uh, Riga, Vilnius, and Warsaw. So we will have a model which would predict what number of rights in one city uh, from number of rights in all other cities. And during the experiment, we know all this like the rights in other cities. So we can model what would be number of rights if, we, if, we, if uh, everything stays as the same. So basically we can model this control group matrix. 
And then like when the experiment starts, we roll out features for all. It's our treatment group and we model our control group. So basically it's how you like synthetically uh, uh, like do this control group and uh, then compare. Um, yeah, so the, uh, we discussed uh, different types of experiments uh, and now like uh, maybe let uh, think like each of you for like Nina, what are main takeaways that uh, you learned today and uh, what is like the thing, things which you remember uh, like and what was uh, most interesting for you? And uh, if you want, you can share with others as well. And then if somebody wants, wants to share, I can say out loud. Nobody doesn't want to tell. I don't think it would be learned by me, but mm -hmm. these experiments are something I'm really interested in about mm -hmm. before. And we got it on the test, yes, that's very interesting. I'm looking for that, but it would be learned with something new today. Okay. I'm cool. already learning when you were saying that. <laughs> Do you understand it now? Yeah, kind of. It's a pretty simple model. Mm -hmm. It's straightforward. It's just finding the best one and working with that. Okay. So, add on to that, like, uh, the main problem here might be um, the way that students aren't really taught any of this. Like, uh, most of what you mentioned does not, like, have, I don't have any experience doing that in my bachelor's year, nor probably won't have any experience doing it here. Um, and I think that mostly stems from the fact that uh, even at master's level, we are taught how to, um, we're taught the basics of every specific thing, but uh, it has like follow up branches, the same way that programming does. If you were to teach someone in uh, Java, they would probably be able to understand uh, C or C sharp really quickly. And uh, it's kind of the same way with this, where um, like the 10 different t tests that you mentioned, it's like, uh, I can't, I'm fairly certain most people here haven't even heard of one alternative t test. So, um, understanding how to find practical value for those t tests is uh, something that I think might be, might be missing in our studies. Well, yeah, I think. Uh... Probably if uh, you would have some course with some advanced topics in statistics, you would touch them. But then, yeah, uh, I agree that uh, if during this course you would understand how to apply them and for each problems, it would give more like, benefits from it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so like, I feel like there's a, if we wanted to do a lot of what you covered in this PowerPoint. Uh, Covered in evaluation of economic policy. We cover a lot of this in the book. Mm -hmm. It's very brief and basically like synthetic control. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's a, a good spot to like start learning. Um, more we want to change it. We want to change it? And do uh, you want to change it? No. Do no? you want to change it? <laughs> no. Oh. Okay. Somebody else? Uh, but uh, here is like uh, points from my side and the takeaways uh, which I want you to have after my presentation. Uh, so if at some point of time you will do some A-B test or other type of experiment, uh, so what you should remember about is about one key metric for experiment not many of them concentrate only on one. Next, uh, do power calculation, meaning if you have experiment, calculate how many users should be there, considering different factors. Next, uh, 
don't run tons of variants at the same time. Uh, uh, remember about other teams running experiments, influencing the results each other. Next point is uh, don't overcomplicate your methods. So I talked today about like A/B tests, uh, multi unrelated, uh, but uh, real life. If you if you work like in some company, you probably will start with some basics because uh, to implement and to actually like use in real time, like in real time, some like bandits requires a lot of like uh, engineering work, not only data science work. So that's why start with basics and then uh, like uh, uh, use uh, some uh, more advanced. Uh, also important point, uh, doing some uh, experiments, it's like thinking about like what can be the impact on users. So don't um, uh, be careful of launching things because they don't hurt. So you can, see, uh, you can think in the beginning that this red curve button uh, does not you implement anything, uh, but maybe in real life uh, users you see this red button in just like then delete app, and uh, you don't want maybe such things. So uh, when doing some like crucial changes, uh, experiment with some the small uh, share of users, and only when you're sure that it will not like uh, have worse consequences, uh, then roll out for more. And uh, like uh, obviously, like you're as a like, future data analyst, data scientist, uh, you will like know more about that, and uh, you should be involved in this process of experiments. And if some like product managers do that, they should uh, also involve uh, data people to get results, uh, which like everybody can trust. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's all about the topic. Uh, you can find uh, the slides uh, using this link. Uh, and also, if uh, you want to know more like about how data science is applied at Vault, we have a medium blog, so you can check it out. Um, also, in our career page, we have a different position also for a junior, like data analyst or like junior company analyst or something. So, if you're interested in like internship or something, you also can have a look. Uh, but now, like, if you have uh, like other questions about like topic of, of experiments or like uh, in general about <coughs> data science, I have like, a trivial question. Yeah? Uh, like, is there a way in the company that the company can see how efficiently data science uh, group works? I have to say, uh, let's say you uh, brought an example where you say. All right, maybe you have a uh, user method which uh, requires another uh, new algorithm which requires a huge of engineering work. So overall, uh, how can the company know like, whether it is uh, it was efficient or not to to do the overall experiment? Maybe it was like uh, the costs were more than the benefit from the experiment. So you, is there a way that company measures? So yeah, like for uh, any like data science related work, we measure what would be the impact uh, on company. So how it actually it will uh, it will increase uh, like GMV, like this gross merchandise value of my metric, or like number of users. So we measure what would be the impact of this particular activity, and uh, that's why like how we sh like show impact of data science. Work. And la later on, you uh, try to see whether actually it did as, as it was expected or not, probably. Because maybe yeah, you, you, sure. measure, you, you like evaluate that, okay, it will give this result, but uh, in, as a, like in reality, it doesn't. So. But yeah, I'm talking about like real impact. So like All before right. doing some like test, uh, we can have some expectation, but then we compare like what were, uh, was our expectation in real life and what our like, impact, which we evaluate this work being based on Okay, and in that case, like one more question comes here. So maybe, uh, how can you be sure that uh, uh, increase or may, uh, decrease of the like, company's revenues, for example, uh, was based on the experiment you did? Maybe some other factors like affected on it, about which you don't even know. So, uh, do you also measure that part or not? Uh, it's very important uh, point as well, but uh, if you just like uh, consider some like 
uh, A-B test, confront treatment, and measure mm -hmm. like revenue in uh, two groups. Uh, but we do it at the same time, and the uh, uh, control group will be different from like treatment just by one like, feature. Uh, okay. uh, and then like we actually measure what is effect of this. So you see the main factor that you yeah. change. So basically, if uh, something, uh, there are some, if like, some I know event happening it will influence in the same direction concurrent treatment so like uh, if let's say you have like a, a revenue at this level during like week before experiment and then uh, during uh, second week there is some event and like super much or something and actually revenue increase at this level even in control group mm -hmm. but uh, this increase will be in control and treatment and still if there is change like difference between treatment control you uh, see it then, then yeah. yeah and one more uh, general yeah. question so uh, what would you recommend us to what skills do you recommend us to gain like uh, to be very good in data science i mean we study r we study python like what else would you suggest to have uh, so uh what I really like about quantitative, quantitative economics programs is that we had like this introduction to like Python to learn and so on because it's really useful skills for data scientists. Uh, also, what is important is like uh, knowing SQL. Uh, you, some you mentioned like for start with yes, this SQL. So uh, it's uh, like very important because like to get data, you need to get it from somewhere, and like nobody will give you a CSV. You will uh, extract it from like databases, and for that you need to know uh, SQL. Uh, what else, like, what helped me, like, to gain more, like, knowledge about machine learning, and uh, I took some courses from computer science department, because we don't have, like, machine learning course and QA, uh, QE, uh, curricula, and also, uh, I took, uh, like, from Coursera, like, there are, like, free courses, you can just, like, watch and then do some exercise, and uh, uh, it gives you more, like, background about models, uh, and so on. Yes, it's like uh, learn more like SQL, uh, give more uh, knowledge about machinery models. Well, actually, they like work from a mathematical point of view. Mm -hmm. That's the main part. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I actually didn't have a general question yeah. or comment. So, I did a video of both, and there are many things that you guys do, and I'm interested in one thing. So, uh, when, let's say that you want to increase the user base, uh, people using both, and when you, when you want to do that, um, do you just run experiments with people using both already, or is there another way of you guys to do an experiment and then see the effects of that? For example, um, at the beginning of the year, in academic year, there are going to be a lot of new students, and so they don't know where the city, where places are in the city, so they might actually take a boat or some other taxis. So, like, you would have some hike in that short term yeah. period. But how do you how do you sustain that? What kind of experiments would you run to sustain those kind of things? Is there a problem? Uh, so, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, uh, if it relates to uh, what I covered, it is like. Uh, tracking multiple metrics during experiment. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if we like start some experiment in the beginning of uh, like this study year, then we will have more new users probably, as you mentioned. And uh, we need uh, to like uh, track this number of new users, let's say, because maybe change we which we introduce is uh, have different direction of impact of new users and current users. So. Um, let's say we you know, like, uh, introduce new feature and uh, we do it in the beginning in September and uh, after running the test we see no difference. Okay, confront treatment is different, or is the same, it's the same level. But uh, if we would separate it for new users and for existing users, then we could observe that for new users this metric increase and for current users is decrease. So like when we do experiment, we also see not like the whole like uh, metric change across groups, but uh, also we uh, do some um, splitting into smaller groups and see what is going there. Because uh, maybe if, uh, if 
as I described, it can be effective in different control groups. Uh, um, my question is, um, what is um, the difference between data science and data analysis? Um, so in data analytics, uh, it's um, mostly about like data analysis in general. So like um, our data analysts, uh, they are like um, focused on um, just uh, like, uh, for example, product managers, uh, uh, have a lot of like ad hoc questions. Uh, um, how does like uh, number price uh, uh, relates to uh, let's say number of drivers which we have? So it's basically just data analysis. You don't build any models. You just see like what was the like, number of drivers, number of drivers, and uh, you are see what is the direction of this like <laughs> relationships and. Uh, yeah, you just like then tell it to product managers. Also, our data analysts they are involved in business intelligence, so like uh, uh, building dashboards for operations for products uh, managers as so. well. And data science is more about like automating work of data analysis. So it's like uh, we see that a lot of people ask the same questions. Maybe like uh, we need to automate it somehow. Also, data science is about machinery models, so we are working like more on that. Uh, like, yeah, data analysis, no, they, they don't use like machine learning models. Like some predictive models which will like uh, forecast uh, different values. Yeah. So then, I'm sorry, <coughs> the mermaid's question was actually interesting. Uh -huh. So, uh, based on this question, is a data scientist, no, let's say it this way, the data analyst is the beginning the road of data science or they are completely different i would roads. say yes because like the data science it involves like data analysis also and uh, like uh, uh, if you gain like uh, more understanding about like how this uh, how the data analysis process work then it's uh, like uh, much easier for you to gain some more like knowledge and skills about like programming and so on and be a data scientist mm. But yours is a business intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> That's right. So I mean, uh, business intelligence, uh, um, like data science, does not relate to that part. Mm -hmm. yeah. But data analysts, they are in the field of this business intelligence. Yeah. Right. So basically, what business intelligence is just like some platform in a company where like uh, managers uh, see like different reports, dashboards, and so on, and it should be like automated, maintained, and so on. Yeah. Like the, the data analytics, they are more in decision making. Mm. Decision making process. Like data analytics are more in decision making process. They help, uh, yeah, in, in uh, this the process. Yeah. Not, not for procedure. Yeah, they, ah, all right. Well, let's say data scientists more, more like they are taking the data, building the model, answering questions. Yeah, uh -huh. Then data analysts, let's say they are the team of data analysts. They are taking the, the results. Uh, no, like uh, um, data scientists, they do this like uh, data extraction by themselves as well. Hmm. I mean, that's uh, where this uh, uh, skills are over hmm. yeah. uh, But uh, actually, what uh, else like uh, is needed to be a data science scientist is like uh, programming as well. So like. Uh, of course, you can know like Python at some basic level, but uh, still uh, you need more practice with that. Because uh, when you're data science, you're not a data scientist, uh, like you're not only responsible for building some prototype in Jupyter Notebook. Uh, you can be also responsible for like putting this model into production. And then you should be able to write this like production level code. And uh, it should be like optimized, for example, or like uh, uh, with, uh, without some like obviously without some bugs, but and also optimized from like latency point of view, so it should work fast and so on. And uh, this skill is just what came from practice, I would say. So you just like need to practice, do some Kaggle competition, for example. And uh, yes, then we give you like know more how to use it. But also my advice uh, like uh, for you, uh, like to practice more, yet yeah, do some couple competitions, or maybe like participate in some hackathons as well. So 
Did somebody participate in any like garage party or any other kind of? No. Not here. But uh, anyway, like I, I don't know. Uh, like, not only in Estonia, but also in some other places. Okay, in garage party? Uh, no, in kind of local one. Huh? In the local one. Okay. Because here in Estonia, there are a lot of opportunities uh, to do that. A lot of happenings uh, happening. So like uh, you can be like uh, or like a data person in a team which you do for a hackathon, or you can be like a product manager, or you can even write some code like as a backend for your like prototype. Uh, uh, I started like yeah, participating in hackathons uh, during my first semester. Uh, like in Tartu. Uh, and uh, first, uh, I was most like business person in the team, thinking about strategy of uh, potential product and so on. Uh, but uh, in uh, latest hackathon, I was more like a data person and uh, like uh, also I write some like, uh, applications. Uh, uh, so I already like knew more and I could apply my skills and. Uh, what helped me actually to, to gain all the skills and later apply it. And just like yesterday, I returned from Junction. It's the uh, biggest hackathon in Europe. It's like uh, 1,500 participants. And it's like very, very huge. So it's not like Mirage for TV's uh, hackathons in Estonia. It's totally different. And uh, <clears throat> there you can actually like, uh, like <clears throat> Build something, uh, yeah, and uh, try even learn something new and like connect to other people. And so, any other questions? So, like. Uh, Maybe like about internship, you yeah, inter asked me to cover this topic. <laughs> the topic. So when I uh, was like, a student, uh, um, I just participated in uh, like project together with my uh, uh, my friends. Uh, we did a project uh, which was like uh, some competition. So we need to like write not policy but uh, make some proposal about unemployment. Uh, you know, like, in Europe and uh, make this like a project, like what we are do going to do, how we measure it and so on. Uh, and uh, it took about like two and a half months. So it was like, uh, it was a very long project. We like to do a lot of analysis, uh, uh, talk to, to different companies uh, um, and it was considered as my internship. And uh, uh, other people from quantitative economics, they actually like, uh, you know, Got internship in banks or in like as a junior data analyst and so on. And, and both uh, uh, this summer we had uh, internship in like data science team. We had uh, two interns. Um, so like uh, if you want to apply, so you can do it. Did your internship in both? Right? Uh, no, uh, I did my internship when I was a student as like uh, competing in some like, competition and doing project. Oh, so, okay. Just this summer we had like, I had like a, I mentored intern in, in data science team at both. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Yes. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, if you will have any other questions, you can connect me on LinkedIn. Or just if you need some advice and so on. Huh? Cool. Then thank you.